Coming on to stage for the very first time, the wonderful Stephen Dennis! Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, good evening. I was very interested to hear that uh, quail's eggs. I don't recall that many quail's eggs, but now you mention it, the white linen uh, did, did feature now and then. <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on, moving on. Nice to see so many of you. I'm Stephen, and I'm here to talk about your uh, Bright Club specialty research, my research into competition law. Oh, yes, very fun. <laughs> Thrilling, just what you came and paid money to see. Yes, well, there'll be a survey on the way out. <laughs> anyway, competition law. We'll get on to that in a minute. First, there is a threshold matter, a threshold matter, which is that some of you seem not to have noticed. It said 7.30 for 8.30. Now, in my book, that's black tie. <laughs> I see very few of you actually did that, and I was worried that would happen, which is why, as you can tell, I'm slumming it tonight. <laughs> so yes, it's uh, dressed down today. <laughs> well, moving on. I promised you to talk about the law, but I have this issue that a lot of people do think I'm a little bit posh. I don't, <laughs> don't really understand this. A colleague of mine, I, to, to get this job, I had to give a lecture to the faculty, which was a scary business. So it was sort of all defensive, and all defenses up. Well, she said afterwards, it was a very nice presentation, but she spent the first five minutes wondering if I'd come to collect the rent. <laughs> You know, naturally, I was concerned by this, so I uh, asked them at the wine club. <laughs> at the wine club, they said, no man with your appalling taste in wine has any business considering himself posh. <laughs> Very reassuring. I asked my driver. <laughs> I, I like my driver. He's a very helpful man. Anyway, he said to me, you know what, Stephen? You ain't even got one place in Spain, have you? Can't really call yourself posh, can you, till you got free? I said, well, yes, thank you. That's a very helpful thought. But no, actually, I don't have a driver. But uh, I do have an excuse to have one if ever I wanted one. Get out of that awkward situation of being the man and all that. Well, anyway, the excuse is that I was once violently robbed in a cab in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love that didn't extend much brotherly love to me one night in 2008. Perhaps the wrong kind of brotherly love. Whatever it was. Got in this cab, this guy pulled a gun on me, took me to an ATM, and robbed me. And he was planning to impoverish me one transaction at a time. So I, I thought, well, this is rather interesting. Especially because my car didn't work. Which wasn't really in his plan. It was not his modus operandi to... Uh, take people whose cars didn't work. So I thought, hey, you've got to think quickly, Stephen, you've got to think quickly. In the end I said, I come from a very poor country. England is a very, very poor country. And, well, you know, cards don't work because I just don't have any money. And he seemed rather contrite, apologized, and drove me to where I needed to go. And then bizarrely gave me three dollars in change. So not only did I talk my way out of the robbery, but I actually received a tip. And I told some friends afterwards and they said, Stephen, with negotiation skills like that, you really should go into the law. And I thought, well, yes. But the question arose, what type of law? Well, I'd had enough of criminal law after Philadelphia. <laughs> so I decided to do the legal equivalent of what a doctor would call the diseases of the rich. <laughs> Very good specialty. You know, plastic surgeons in Beverly Hills, that's the type of medicine you want to practice. The legal equivalent is, of course, corporate law and the canyons of steel. So I decided to do competition law. And I promised to tell you something about competition law. So here we are. Competition law is a subject that tells you what big companies are not allowed to do, what is considered naughty when done by a sufficiently big person. <laughs> Quite an interesting subject. Two companies want to merge, can they do it? People spend their lives, believe it or not, on this very subject. And there are two interesting things about it. One is that you deal a lot with economists, and economists are very unfairly maligned. 
Economists are in fact very funny people, not dismal at all. Don't know where that comes from. <laughs> no, economists are brilliant. They actually have a lot of jokes. It's probably because they're mostly academics and have lots of time. So they uh, write these page-long, two-page-long jokes, and they're quite good, some of them. We love our models, not least their curves. <laughs> you might be an economist if you don't sell your children now because you think they might be worth more to you later on. <laughs> But the other aspect of it is it's quite international. One country says you can't merge, that often tanks the deal, or at least makes it difficult. So you're dealing with people all over the world, it's a combined effort, and this leads to the need for great sensitivity to cultural differences. You need to be really careful, if you're gonna convince someone to do something for you, you absolutely have to talk on their wavelength. This was brought home to me rather forcefully. I was talking to a neighbor, it's a farmer in Yorkshire, and he learnt I was going to go and do some EU law. And needless to say, in this age of Euro-scepticism, he wasn't very impressed. So he leant on the fence, only literally, not figuratively, as you'll see. <laughs> and he said, Bloody EU, what do you want to do that for? EU? EU? Ugh, ruined my farm, you know. Bloody cucumber regulations and bananas, bendy bananas, bloody hell. What do you want to go wasting your life like that for when you could be perfectly good solicitor in Aragon? <laughs> well, what we need in this country is strong leader to get us out of EU. Strong leader, like Saddam Hussein. <laughs> hmm. Well, I didn't want to argue, so I said, I can see your point, but unfortunately they hanged Mr. Hussein, and so regrettably, just this once, his services are unavailable. You may wish to look up the phone number of some other dictator, you know, look under C for Castro or something like that. Anyway. Saddam Hussein, not in the EU. The international side was very interesting. I worked for a while in Brussels, that was fun. People used to say of Brussels, the best thing about it is it's four hours from Paris. <laughs> well, that's a very kind thought. But did you know that with the Thalys, you can travel in great sophistication to Paris in one hour these days? This is progress by a certain definition. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the international aspects were always fun, hence the tagline, embassy hopping, you could have endless fun at the embassies, lots of parties and so forth, all very good. In fact, I remember particularly the Brazilian embassy, which seemed not so much to be an embassy built for representation as an embassy that had been built around a continuing party. <laughs> but, uh, that was great fun, marvellous place. No, no, working all over the place, worked for a while in London, worked for a while in Brussels, New York. New York was great fun. And people tended to ask me afterwards, so, which did you prefer then? Brussels? New York? <laughs> well, if you get that question, it's a question you shouldn't answer because it's very political. You get yourself into hot water. You know, it's one of those things. Do you have wet dreams about a European superstate? And if not, why not? <laughs> Alternatively, those goddamn Europeans, they regulate my foot if they had half a chance. So it's best just not to uh, answer a question like that and to dodge it. So I tell an anecdote, marvellous thing, telling an anecdote about meeting in the middle, about splitting the difference, working out cultural differences, being sensitive to them. Remember my office neighbour in New York was a very loud man from New Jersey. If you will imagine somebody like Tony Soprano practicing law, this guy was spectacular. He once broke a phone in anger. This quite an achievement. Anyway, come booming through the walls, the latest trial or tribulation of the practicing lawyer, you say, you know what? I don't believe it. I do not believe it. This is outrageous. It stinks. You know what? I think they're trying to fuck you around. Your Honor. <laughs> and I thought, yes, one does have to be sensitive to uh, wear your practicing law. It's very important. Quite a different art form in uh, New Jersey than it is elsewhere. <laughs> but the funny thing was, eventually, 
eventually he started hearing my calls through this thin wall. And mine were very much more quiet. I would thank people for coming onto the call. I would, you know, say, take care at the end, mind out, it's cold, etc. And this started to spread between the two of us. So I became louder and more assertive to the point that colleagues in Europe would think me obnoxious. And he became a bit quieter, as in, I think they're trying to fuck you around, Your Honor. Take care. <laughs> Well, that's uh, called Meeting in the Middle, a key loyalty skill. One tries to instill it in students. Here I am, owing my life to bad education, had the guy in the cab known that I uh, was in fact not from an impoverished country, then uh, he presumably would not have spared me, would not have taken kindly to that. So here I am, raising this next generation of lawyers, the sharp breeder, as it were, <laughs> who owes his life to poor education. Maybe it's good that the people with the guns don't know where the other people are. I don't know. Anyway, if I leave you with nothing else, one is always raised to give practical advice. It's definitely that. Meet in the middle. Be appreciative to differences. As it were, take care. But by no means let them fuck you around. <laughs>